Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nirav Shaw. I'm the director of the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm joined this afternoon by Governor Janet Mills, Commissioner Jean Lambrew of the Department of Health and Human Services, Commissioner Heather Johnson of DECD. We're here today to provide an update on the COVID-19 situation across the state. I'll start by providing some of the numbers in terms of where we are and pull back a bit to talk about the public health landscape and some considerations that we have for reopening and then turn things over to Governor Mills. In terms of the numbers, Maine CDC is currently reporting 1,040 cases of COVID-19. That's an increase of 17 cases since yesterday. 163 individuals have been hospitalized at some point during their COVID-19 illness. That's an increase of two since yesterday. And there have sadly been 51 individuals who have passed away, which is the same number as yesterday. At present, there are 17 individuals across the state who are hospitalized in intensive care units with COVID-19 and 16 individuals who are hospitalized in non-intensive care unit beds across the state. And as of this moment, seven individuals remain on ventilators with COVID-19. Of those 1,040 cases, 245 are healthcare workers. And I'd again like to thank each and every healthcare worker across the state for continuing to go into work, even though many other folks are staying home, they continue to go to work to keep people in Maine very safe. I'd like next to provide a quick update on some of the outbreaks that Maine CDC and our colleagues are working on across the state at healthcare facilities and long-term care facilities. For convenience today, I'm, going to just, I'm just going to provide the total number of residents and staff who are affected. If anyone would like the deeper numbers, our communications director can provide them. But at the Augusta Center for Health and Rehabilitation, there are now a total of 75 residents and staff who have tested positive for COVID-19. At Edgewood, there have been 14 residents and staff. At Falmouth by the Sea, 32 residents and staff. At the Maine Veterans Home in Scarborough, 51 residents and staff. At the Tall Pines facility in Waldo County, 43 residents and staff. And at the Cedars of Portland, 14 residents and staff. I'd like next now to turn to a few slides that I'd like to review with everybody that set the landscape for how, from a public health perspective, we are thinking about and considering making decisions around reopening uh, as we move through the process of stages that Governor Mills will outline in just a moment. On the first slide, what you'll see are some of the criteria that our team has thought about and developed in partnership with public health experts from around the country, taking a lead from best practices that have been discussed. We're focused our analysis from a public health perspective when it comes to reopening on three general categories. The first thing that we're looking at is an overall reduction in the number of symptoms of COVID-19 out there. And we look at that from two different angles, which I'll talk about in a moment. The second big category of things that we look at are an overall decrease in the number of cases. And not just a decrease in the cases, but the severity of those cases as well. Because in any outbreak, it's important not just to look at the scope of the outbreak, but also the magnitude, the impact that the outbreak is having. And again, I'll go through both of those two criteria in just a minute. And then the third pillar, the third large group that we're looking at is our overall preparedness in our health system. What is the capacity of the health system to continue to provide care for everyone in Maine, even as we think about recovering from an outbreak and taking steps toward reopening? So on the next slide, I'd like to take a deeper, uh, take a, a deeper dive into that first big bucket, which is how we look at symptoms. The purpose of taking a hard look at symptoms as opposed to confirmed cases, the reason we look at symptoms 
is to the is to measure the burden of the potential of COVID-19 that might be out there and capture those patients who might have COVID-19 even if they haven't yet been tested. We've talked about at these meetings how in any outbreak situation, whether it's COVID-19, the flu, or anything else out there, we're only seeing a part of the iceberg at any one time. But as we take steps towards staging a reopening, we also need to account for that part of the iceberg that we might not see, but that we know is there. And this measure to allow us to look at symptoms accomplishes that. On the graph at the left, you'll see that one of the things we're tracking is a strict symptom-based definition that objectively looks at the number of people who are visiting healthcare providers, certain healthcare providers across the state with symptoms of the flu, which as everyone knows are similar to the symptoms of COVID-19. And what you see on this graph was a significant uptick in those visits in, in early April, late March, and then now a reduction in those. On the right, we take a look at the same idea, the number of symptoms, but we zoom in a, a, a lot more closely on just COVID-19. For this graph on the right, we don't look at general symptoms of the flu. We look really specifically at the symptoms that we know are unique to COVID-19. And even here, what you see is something similar, which is an uptick in the middle of, of late March, early April, and then a decline as the month has gone on. These numbers give us some confidence that we are headed in the right direction and, the, and that a lot of the work that we've talked about in terms of flattening the curve is having an effect, not just with COVID-19, but with other respiratory illnesses, including COVID-19. Again, these two graphs suggest that we are making progress toward moving toward that stage reopening. On the next slide, I'd like to take a deeper look and a broader look at the overall number of cases of COVID-19 and the impact that COVID-19 has had across the state. We do so through two lenses. The first lens just takes a look at the overall number of cases and how that's changed on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. And then we also take a look not just at the number of cases, but the impact the severity of those cases. The slide on the left does the former. What it does is charts the number of new laboratory confirmed cases of COVID-19 that Maine CDC has reported and recorded day on day, going back to our very first case. And what you see is a lot of variation. You see a peak and then a decline, and then another uptick, and then a decline. A lot of those follow patterns that we're aware of. For example, as we've discussed, Earlier this month, we were one of the first states to move toward universal testing in long-term care facilities when we detect an outbreak. And you can see on this graph in the blue, the number of cases on the bars that we've seen that are related to long-term care facilities. When we go looking for things, we found them. And you can see that reflected in the data here. But I'd also ask everyone to turn their attention to the blue line, which might be a bit faint, but what you can see is that in the recent days, we have leveled off. That curve has flattened. Now that doesn't mean that things are getting better. It does mean that things are about the same as they were yesterday, which is an average of about 20 cases a day. So we've got a little bit more work to do here, but it does suggest that we are trending in the right general direction. Similarly, the graph on the right shows the number of hospitalized patients. This gives us a sense of the impact, the severity of the outbreak on Maine people on a day-to-day -day basis. Similarly there, we saw something of an increase that looks like it plateaued in the middle of the month and has now started trending downward. We'd like to see that trend come down even more, but it also tells us again, we're headed in the right direction. And on the next slide, I'd like to take a, look, a closer look at the impact of COVID-19 on hospital capacity, hospital preparedness. And we do that through thinking about two criteria. The first is whether our hospitals have sufficient capacity to treat each and every patient with COVID-19 without becoming overwhelmed. And you can see on the chart that's on this slide that 
there is still sufficient capacity in the healthcare system. Over 100 and se- almost 170 ICU beds remain available. Over 300 ventilators that remain available. That gives us uh, uh, that gives us good security in knowing that as we move through this stage process, capacity in the healthcare system exists. Similarly, on the right, we want to make sure that healthcare providers who are running to the front lines every day have the ability to be tested quickly for COVID-19 if they've been exposed. And right now, healthcare providers remain in our top tier for testing and can get results returned to them quickly. All of these three measures lay the groundwork from a public health perspective to allow us to start moving toward a staged reopening. But these criteria, these three buckets are necessary, but they are not sufficient. So on the next slide, I'd like to close by detailing the additional public health measures that we know are again necessary because the others are not yet sufficient. The things I've talked about previously are are the floor, but we need to aim higher and go toward more of a ceiling. So the three things on this slide are the additional public health measures that will be layered on top of the data that we're already tracking. And there are things that we've talked about for several weeks now like expanding our ability to test across the state. The second is to expand our team of contact tracers so that when a case tests positive, that person can be quickly isolated and not spread the infection to others. And then finally, our work to continue making sure that hospitals are prepared, that they have PPE that they need to keep their healthcare workers safe and that they can maintain the surge capacity that they would need to have if cases rebound. And that's the note that I'd like to end on. Even though we are trending in the right direction right now, there is the possibility that things could go back and we could have another spike. So one of the things that our team at Maine CDC is focused on is not just looking forward, but always looking at the day-to-day data to be able to detect any kind of spike or resurgence, which would alter the plans that Governor Mills will be talking about. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to Governor Mills. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, I can't think of a better person to be in charge of uh, the CDC at this time of our uh, collective lives in this pandemic. Uh, You've been a stalwart for the truth, for accuracy, for data, uh, and for uh, your experience. We all thank you. What is it that draws us to the quiet hum of a crowded restaurant or to a crowded bar on a Saturday night or to the doorway of a local small business or the chair of a barber or or a hairdresser who asks us about our life or to the bleachers of a high school basketball game or to pews praying side by side? We go to all those places so that we can be together. These places look very different now but it is people that made them special. Friends, neighbors, family, members of the community, people who now are staying apart so that someday we can all be together again at many of those places that mean so much to all of us. To you, the main people, I want to express my deep appreciation. I know these past few weeks have been extremely difficult, but you have stayed the course And because of your cooperation and your sacrifices, Maine has started to flatten the curve against this pandemic. But I want to be clear, we are not out of the woods yet and likely will not be for some time. Many experts across the country predict a resurgence of this deadly virus by next winter or even by this coming fall. So as other states experience widespread devastating outbreaks, We cannot afford to let down our guard, which is why today I'm announcing that I will extend the stay-at-home order in the form of a new Stay Safer at Home executive order. This order will be effective through May 31st and will allow Maine people to continue to engage in activities that are already permitted, such as occasional grocery shopping, exercise, but it will also be modified to allow us to participate in the safe and gradual reopening, restarting of our economy that I'm about to outline. Before I begin that, however, I want to reiterate, while this plan presents a path forward 
for slowly restarting our economy. It should not lure Maine people into thinking that the pandemic is almost over or that things will be back to normal soon. The hard truth is that things are not normal and that they will likely not be normal anytime soon. And that with this plan, we are beginning to invent a new normal, a different way of doing things, of doing business, of shopping, of traveling, of enjoying, enjoying the main outdoors in ways that keep us safe. So what does that new normal look like? The reopening plan builds on my current executive orders, which already allow grocery stores, pharmacies, financial institutions, home repair services, daycare centers, and car repair services, among others, to operate. And then it establishes four stages focused on resuming business operations and activities that are not currently operating, but that can be done safely with strict protocols. Now, this analysis is not, this analysis is not about whether or not a business is quote unquote essential or non-essential. It is about whether and how any business or activity may reopen even in a limited way while protecting public safety and public health. As Dr. Shah has outlined, the Maine CDC will be tracking three primary metrics in its evaluation of whether or not we can move through these stages. One, a downward trajectory of influenza-like illnesses and COVID-like syndromic cases. Two, a downward trajectory of documented cases and newly hospitalized patients. And three, the capacity of our hospital systems to treat all patients without crisis care and the ability of the state to engage in a robust testing program. As our administration gradually eases restrictions on some businesses and activities, we're also implementing protective protocols along with broader additional health and safety measures to protect all Maine people. For example, in order to reopen in any stage, various sectors of Maine's economy will work with the Department of Economic and Community Development to implement practical, evidence-informed safety protocols and modifications to protect the health and safety of employees and customers. These accommodations may be as simple as closing break rooms to avoid congregation of people, providing flexible working hours to avoid crowds, and installing plexiglass shields, as many stores have done, or maybe as complex as adjusting a business's sales process to ensure employee and customer safety. This collaboration between DECD and the private sector will result in what will be known as COVID-19 prevention checklists. These checklists will identify best practices for the businesses specific to their operations as well as general best practices related to physical distancing, hygiene, personal protection, and the maintenance of clean workplaces, among other things. The checklist, which will differ sector to sector, will undergo a rigorous review process, including from government officials, health experts, and industry, industry representatives. Once completed, businesses that commit to complying with the requirements on the checklist will be provided a badge to post on their business door or on their website. Their names will also be posted on the DECD website and they will be allowed to open. In terms of timing, progression through the four stages will occur month to month, but depend as well on the success of previous stages. For example, stage one, beginning on May 1, if there are new, no new trends that change the plan, stage two will begin in June and stage three will begin in July and continue through August. Stage four, which envisions lifting, lifting most of the, the most number of instruct, uh, restrictions will start at a point to be determined in the future. A month by month breakdown of the stages allows us time to assess the effectiveness of the health and safety precautions that we adopt 
and to evaluate the potential need to adjust course, but the month-by-month -month plan should not be considered a hard and fast timeline. As I said earlier, the Maine CDC will monitor data to inform decisions on the appropriateness of proceeding through stages and lifting restrictions. If the Maine CDC detects any resurgence of the virus, we will move quickly to halt progression through the stages and re-implement restrictions to protect your health and safety. Again, businesses and activities in all stages must work with the Department of Economic and Community Development to develop and implement appropriate safety precautions prior to reopening. Those precautions are reviewed by our public health officials. Now for the stages. Stage one. Beginning May 1, this Friday, Stage 1 continues the prohibition on gatherings of more than 10 people, the quarantine of all people entering or returning into Maine, quarantining for 14 days, and the special precautions we've had for older Mainers and others at risk of COVID-19. Stage 1 calls for people who can work from home to continue to do so including the more than 80% of state employees who are doing so now. It will also now require that Maine people wear face cloth coverings, cloth face coverings in public settings where physical distancing is difficult and that they continue strict requirements for long-term care facilities where, as we know, Maine has seen several outbreaks. My administration will issue an emergency rule uh, for nursing facilities today and issue guidance on cloth face coverings in the coming days. Stage one also allows for the limited expansion of certain businesses, certain religious and quality of life activities with appropriate safety precautions. These include health care from Maine licensed providers with recommendations that they prioritize care for patients with time-sensitive conditions, and that they assure the safety of patients and staff and communities, that they manage the use of essential resources like PPE and testing supplies, and that they pace the reopening of services to the level of community COVID-19 COVID activity, that they maintain capacity in our hospitals for any potential outbreaks. Stage one also allows certain personal services, barbershops, hair salons, and pet grooming according to specific protocols. They may open. It allows limited drive-in and stay-in-your-vehicle religious services to be conducted. Drive-in movie theaters, outdoor recreation, for instance, guided outdoor, act outdoor activities, hunting and fishing, and the restricted use of golf and disc golf courses. State parks, state-owned public land trails, and historic sites may open, although certain coastal state parks will remain closed. Auto dealerships and car washes. Automated, automated car washes, right? That's stage one. Stage two, tentatively beginning June 1, stage two contemplates revising the limitation on gatherings from less than 10 to less than 50 people. It also calls for people who can work from home to continue to do so, but allows for employees in certain fields to begin to re-enter the office as needed, including state employees. Stage two maintains the recommended 14-day quarantine for people entering or re-entering Maine and special precautions for older Mainers and people with, who, at, who are at risk because of underlying medical conditions. With appropriate safety precautions, stage two will allow for some degree of opening by reservation only with capacity limits and other measures for restaurants, for fitness and exercise centers, nail technicians, retail stores for broader in-store shopping, lodging and campgrounds for Maine residents, day camps for Maine children, and the coastal state parks that are closed now. That's stage two. Stage three, tentatively, beginning July 1. Stage three contemplates maintaining the prohibition on gatherings of more than 50 people 
and other stage one and stage two restrictions like the 14 day quarantine on people coming into Maine. And with appropriate safety precautions, stage three would allow for some degree of opening for lodgings such as hotels, Airbnb, campgrounds, summer camps, RV parks for Maine residents and visitors. We are developing guidelines now to assist those entities in safely reopening and reservations should not be accepted until those guidelines are issued. It will also allow for outdoor recreation such as charter boats and boat excursions. It will allow for bars to be open July 1 and personal services such as spas, spas, tattoo and piercing parlors, massage facilities, etc. among other things. That's stage three. Stage four. Now there's no time frame for stage four at this point. However, this last stage contemplates, if all goes well, lifting restrictions and allowing all businesses and activities to resume with appropriate safety precautions. Now, my administration is also working with stakeholders to develop plans for a safe return to school in the fall for all grades. And I expect to have guidance available by mid-June to share with you all on that issue. The stages outlined above are a framework for planning. Innovations or expanded testing and other capacity might accelerate the pace as could a determination that cert certain parts of Maine, such as some rural areas, might be able to ease restrictions safely sooner. At the same time, a surge in COVID-19 in parts or all of Maine could result in significant adjustments to the plan and a return to more restrictions. Please understand when I say, we're not flipping a switch today from closed to open. We are adjusting the dials, easing some restrictions while adding others. The month of May will look very similar to the month of April, except that you may, with added precautions, take your pet to the groomer, get a haircut, buy a car, worship in your car during a drive-in religious service, receive medical care that you may have put off, and participate in outdoor activities in a way that protects your health and the health and safety of everyone around you. And every one of us will continue to protect our health by taking the same preventative measures that have helped to avoid catching a cold, washing your hands often for 20 seconds each time, cover coughs and sneezes, no shaking hands, staying home if you're sick. The author Veronica Roth once said, quote, there are so many ways to be brave in this world. Sometimes bravery involves laying down your life for something bigger than yourself or for someone else. Sometimes it involves giving up everything you've ever known or everyone you've ever loved for the sake of something greater. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's nothing more than gritting your teeth and getting through the pain and work of every day, the slow walk toward a better life. That's the sort of bravery, she said, I must have now. That's the sort of bravery and patience we all must have now. These plans are just that, they're plans. We don't know what will happen in the next days, weeks, or months. We may well have to start and stop and start again or change in a heartbeat to meet whatever challenge greets us with each new day. No one's ever done this before. There's no pandemic playbook, no COVID-19 manual. Things will be confusing because this is complicated. That's okay. We will be flexible, we will be resilient, and we will get through this by doing our part to protect the places that we mean that mean so much to us, the people who make those places so special, and the state we call home within the new normal that requires us to do things in new and unusual and careful and compassionate ways. Thank you, and Dr. Shaw, Commissioner Johnson, Commissioner Lambrew, and I would be happy to take some questions. Great. Thank you very much, Governor.
We've got a full roster, and today's first question uh, goes to Kate Koff from the Ellsworth American. Go ahead, Kate. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaw. Um, so two quick questions, both directed at Governor Mills. Um, the first is, it, it looks as though, um, from these plans, that the 14-day quarantine requirement that is coming into the state will probably be in place throughout the summer in some form or another. Um, but I think the average length of stay on, on Manchester Island, for example, is you know between three and five days. And it seems relatively unlikely that you're going to have out-of-state visitors who can take two weeks for quarantine and then time for vacation up, um, beyond that. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, with that in mind, if the state has any plans beyond what the federal government has put forward to help the seasonal businesses who will probably have a pretty curtailed season if they have a season at all. Um, and then my second question is, I'm wondering if you can, um, you know, we've got the growing season getting started in Maine, and I'm wondering, we've, we've had some reports of farm workers who are stuck in other states or kind of in visa processing limbo. And I'm wondering if you can update us on the status of the state's migrant workers and um, any plans you're putting in place to protect their health once, health once they do get here. The second question I know was about uh, migrant farm farm workers, and I know there there have been migrant farm workers arriving as scheduled in the northern part of the state mm -hmm. to help broccoli and potato farmers. I believe um, the federal government has been processing those, and our Department of Labor, I believe, um, uh, participates in the processing of those applications. I don't know of anything further than that regarding uh, the federal uh, federal guidance on uh, agricultural workers. And the first question was about seasonal, uh, the tourist season, basically, and how many uh, entities and businesses in Maine and on the coast in particular are used to taking reservations and getting people here for more than two weeks. Or if they have to quarantine when they're coming here from another state, it's going to put a crimp in their vacation. I think that was the gist of your question. I think. <laughs> okay. She's gone. Okay. Uh, oh. Uh, oh, no, I'm here. No, I was, I was actually I was saying that, um, you know, I think most days, at least in the Mount Desert Island region where we are, are far shorter than two weeks. You know, or, you know, shorter than two weeks. Five days, they come to the weekend. Yeah. And they probably won't be able to take time to do the kind of two week quarantine and then have their vacation. Gotcha. So I'm wondering, you know, I, I think it, it's probably pretty likely that we'll have a pretty cur curtailed tourist season up here. And I'm wondering if the, what the state is, the state's planning anything to help those businesses kind of beyond what the federal government is doing. The state, economically, we don't have a plan to, you know, um, Commissioner Johnson would love to jump in as well. <laughs> uh, we don't have a plan to uh, compensate the businesses that are going to inevitably lose some of the regular tourist, be uh, tourist business during this upcoming season. Um, I'm not sure how else to limit out-of-state travel into Maine that we've all heard about, especially coming from those areas that are now at least a high incidence of COVID-19. Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, they are very high incidence COVID-19 and it's really difficult to not quarantine people coming from those states, whether they're coming to an Airbnb, to a restaurant, to a hotel, to a motel. So. Commissioner Johnson, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, certainly, right. The tourism and hospitality sector is an incredibly important sector for our state's economy. And so we're looking really closely in partnership with the governor's office and other hospitality leaders to, to try to find some solutions, right? Quarantine is the key and best case right now and the best solution. Um, we're partnering with Commissioner Lambrew and Dr. Shaw on testing opportunities and are there ways to use testing and will testing capacity allow us to utilize that as one of the levers that will allow us to open up the hospitality and tourism sector um, a little bit more broadly. And so we don't have all of those final answers right now, but that work is underway and we are actively pursuing solutions because we agree with you, right, that a lot of people don't come for the full 14 days. We would certainly like to find creative solutions that prioritize keeping people safe but also allow for, you know, people to have access to some of these tourism assets that we find so valuable. And it may be that the Congress in, in revisiting the PPP plan will help, uh, uh, help with some recovery efforts, financial recovery efforts for those businesses. I hope they do. Great. Thanks a lot, Kate. We will turn next to Don Kerrigan over at News Center. Don? Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Shaw and Governor Mills. I guess I would have a, uh, two questions. One is a follow-up 
on the tourism question, um, which I would say this sounds like it basically kills much of the tourist season for a lot of a lot of businesses if they need to wait until August at the earliest to have any significant numbers of people come in. Uh, how worried are you, Governor, about that in terms of people's jobs, people's businesses, income to the state and all that? The second question unrelated, uh, I can, I can, you want me to ask that now or wait? Your pleasure. Okay. The other question is for Dr. Sean, which is, uh, there is a facility in Portland, an urgent care facility that started, I don't, excuse me, Southern Maine, that started this week offering antibody tests uh, to patients, $135, I think. Do you see a value in those tests? And uh, is that a good practice? So let me, myself and Commissioner Johnson, address your first ca uh, question, Don, which is about the tourist industry and the upcoming season. And I think it's important to recognize there will be losses, inevitable losses. Um, the whole country is facing this. At the same time, everybody recognizes that while you want to open up a restaurant, your favorite restaurant, you want to open up the local Airbnb and the lodging and, and uh, campgrounds sooner, nobody wants to get sick. And nobody wants their customers to get sick or to die because of um, contact at your facility. That's the balancing act here, and we are trying very carefully to balance the economics and the epidemiological data. That's why we have Dr. Shah, Commissioner Lambrew, Commissioner Johnson, and so many members of the private sector all looking at this, trying to protect our economy, but also, first and foremost, protecting the lives and health and safety of people. Did you hear Yeah, I think it's, and the, the one thing I would add to that is, there may be science, right, that changes this timeline. And the governor's talked about science in both directions today. It may slow the timeline down or and or it may pull it forward. So I think we just want to be aware that, that there is um, an ongoing everyday look in partnership with the private sector on what what is safe to do, when is it safe to do, are things changing that make that, that allow us to make changes as well. And we do that in partnership with Commissioner Lambrew and Dr. Shaw. Dr. Shaw on antibodies. Please. Okay. <laughs> So uh, Don also asks a question about antibody testing. Uh, we are aware that, into, uh, that organizations across the state are starting to offer antibody testing. And those tests generate data. They generate good data, but what's also important with having data is knowing what to do with it and knowing what it means. And right now in the scientific community, there aren't great answers to knowing what the value of antibody testing is. We know it adds value, but how much value and what assurances can we give patients who have tested positive for the antibodies? Those answers are not yet clear. More scientific research is underway to, better get, to get a better handle on that. So what we know two weeks from now will not, be know, will not be what we know today. At this time, we don't recommend that individuals routinely go out and get antibody tests. If you're not feeling well or you've been exposed to somebody or you're a contact of someone with COVID-19, we recommend that you get one of the more traditional tests. Right now, we know how to interpret those data and know what to do with them. But certainly that will change as the science changes. Thanks for that question, Don. And we will turn next uh, to Sarah from the Machias Valley News Observer. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. My question is directed to Governor Mills. Um, Governor, first, could you clarify if stage three's hoped for time frame covers all of july and august or does it end august one it, it proposes to cover july and august got it okay so as you know we love our festivals here in washington <laughs> county and um large ones like the wild blueberry festival do draw quite a few people will the stage three prohibition on gatherings of more than 50 extend to outdoor gatherings and if not, is there a festival checklist in development? Oh, what a great question. I, I wish there were a festival checklist. Unfortunately, and I kind of answered this question yesterday, too. Somebody else called and asked about the Lobster Festival. I'm going to miss those yes. festivals as much as anybody. And, um, but I, I don't know how we can allow them at this point in time. We can revisit it. But I just don't know how we can do it safely. Uh, 
you know they get crowded. They inevitably draw crowds. The three criteria, I, the questions I talked about last week in a, one of these press conferences was, one of them was, how does some particular activity affect travel within Maine or into Maine? And another one was um, whether or not <laughs> there's an inevitable congregation of people by this activity. And festivals and parades are one of those things that we all love, but they're, they bring an inevitable gathering of people that poses a public health risk. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot, Sarah. We will turn now to Brad Rogers over at WGME. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Governor Mills, uh, how much did the economic health of Maine and the fear of some small businesses not being able to recover weigh into your decision to start to reopen? Uh, and just quickly, uh, for employers and employees who don't think it's safe to return to work, are they still going to be eligible for unemployment and other benefits if they choose not to work yet? Well, the second question relating to unemployment uh, brings with it several different criteria, state criteria and federal criteria. I guess the answer it is it depends on which program you file for unemployment. For instance, the new category of self-employed individuals who will now be able to file come Friday. Um, their, their criteria for looking for work or not looking for work are different than the normal state criteria. Also, the special category that we uh, enacted in uh, March with a bipartisan support of the legislature, which allows for temporary layoffs, people under temporary layoff to be collecting unemployment. That does not have the same requirement of actively seeking employment, but those criteria are up, up online at the Department of Labor's website. So rather than answer specifics, uh, anybody with those questions could go on, should go on the website and look. What was your other, your other question? Nothing. The other question small was, business, uh, I'm sorry. The, of of Maine course. And the fear of small businesses not being able to recover way into your decision to start to reopen. I think that the economics of this pandemic are, are widespread and diverse. Maine does have a high number, a uh, high proportion of small businesses compared to most other states. Uh, and they are, in my view, the backbone of our economy. It bothers me to see large entities and large stores being open, small ones not. I, I'd love to see the small businesses reopen. That isn't the primary issue in staging these, these, um, these uh, three phases, four phases of reopening, but it's certainly an issue in my head uh, about being fair to small businesses. It's an important consideration. The primary consideration, obviously, is public health, first and foremost. Next up is T.J. Tremble over at ABC7. Go ahead, T.J. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Governor Mills, you talk about a resurgence and a surge. Could you define what you mean? I think that's more of an epidemiological issue rather than a gubernatorial issue as such, but please... <laughs> Great. So, TJ, there are different criteria that we look at for each of the various measures and buckets that I talked about. We've got criteria for how we think about not just what a usable decline would be, but also what we would look for in a rebound. So just to give you one example of, uh, of what we would consider to be a rebound in the number of cases, uh, that would be a successive increase over a 14-day period where the average number of cases has gone up in the preceding seven days. We'll get you that in writing because it's a lot of, it's a mouthful of words. But TJ, what, what I just want to emphasize is that for each and every one of the criteria that we've talked about, we've defined some guardrails and, uh, and how we think about what it means for there to be a decline as well as for there to be an incline uh, that would cause some of the brakes to be put on as well. And we're taking a look at those at each and every stage to make sure we don't have the secondary resurgence. Thank you. And this one may actually be for Governor Mills. Okay. Governor Mills, you mentioned in your uh, statement that the face mask would be required in certain public settings. Is there a penalty or a potential penalty if those aren't worn in such a setting? Yes, um, the same as a penalty, the same penalty that applies to any violation of any of the executive orders would apply. Class E crime punishable by up to six months. Now there will be guidance on the on the. I, we're not calling them masks. <laughs> I think that's a misnomer. But uh, face coverings. There'll be guidance on that. But it's primarily where you 
reasonably anticipate you're going to be in a relatively crowded situation. You won't be able to keep six feet away from each other as we're trying to do here today at this press conference. And that happens a lot. So it's advisable to always have one on you. Um, have a couple on hand, one, one that's clean and one you had yesterday. But just have one available uh, wherever you might go. TJ, before we move on, I wanted to just add on to my answer from a moment ago. Um, I just want to remind everyone that we're not looking, when we think about a potential rebound, we're not just looking at any one criteria, we're looking at all of them globally at once and making an overall holistic judgment about where things are and whether we might need to pump the brakes. It's not driven by any one criteria. We really want to take a holistic view at it. Uh, we'll take a Thank holistic you. look. Yep. Thanks, TJ. We'll turn next over to Brian Sullivan at WABI. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Shaw and for Dr. Mills, um, or for Governor Mills. Um, Governor, could you just clarify the uh, face coverings in public settings where physical distancing measures measures are difficult to maintain? Just a little more information about what that might look like. And for Dr. Shaw, any thought uh, to starting to release the positive cases in Maine on a town by town or city to city basis? Yeah. I on your first question, we will be putting out guidance, more specific guidance about face coverings. Uh, and I really can't get into it right now because we are dealing, we're do, doing this as a group. Uh, and if I had specifics, I'd, I'd tell you today, but I don't. I'm gonna, we're gonna have to defer on that question till later in the week. And Brian, as to your second question, it's something that we're thinking about. Uh, we've looked at it. We've looked at how other states are thinking about this. Some states like Massachusetts have cho chosen to do so. They also have 50 times the number of cases that we do, even though they only have about five or six times as many people, which means they can release those data on a town by town level without really worrying about compromising privacy, which even though we're in a pandemic, we still have an ethical obligation to protect people's privacy. So in densely parts of, in not dense rural parts of the state, if we were to release those numbers, we could potentially reveal people's identity on a town by town basis. In less dense, more populous parts of the state, releasing those numbers runs into the fact that community transmission is already occurring in all of those places. So the town by town view could actually give people a false sense of security into what's going on. It's why we've chosen to go at the county level. We think that's the right balance between privacy and giving people enough tools to equip them and take the right steps. Um, turning next over to Amy Brown over at WERU. Go ahead, Amy. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, both of my questions are for Governor Mills today. Governor Mills, could you please say more about the process that businesses are going to need to complete in order to be approved for reopening? You mentioned something about a badge for their door and right. their name being listed on the website. And uh, is this hopefully not going to be another situation where there's a website that crashes in the next couple of days as people try to do that? And then also, if you could speak to how you would possibly monitor and enforce a 14-day quarantine during tour season. Uh, sure. First of all, I'm going to ask Commissioner Johnson to weigh in on this, too, because she's been so deeply involved in and dealing with the industries themselves for some time now. This is not a new procedure. We've been talking with representatives from all sectors of the economy, so it's not going to be a surprise to them that we're looking at different protocols and protections in conjunction with public health experts. Uh, she can answer that question. Um, yeah, I'll let her go first. <laughs> Thanks, Governor. Um, so what we'll do is by the end of the day tomorrow, there will be checklists posted for all of the businesses that would fall into stage one. So businesses can go online, they can review the checklist, there will be a place for them to attest that they are going to execute the checklist, then they would be able to download it. As they download it, they will also receive what we're calling a badge or something that they can use both on social media and in their facilities if it's an in-person facility. So the consumers will know they've received the checklist, they're operating under specific guidelines that are intended to keep um, the safety precautions at, at the highest possible level. Um, that's, how we're, that's how people will be able to do it. 
Um, we expect people will just be able to download those. Certainly um, our team is available to help with any questions. Um, numbers of people from the industry have been involved and they seem to be able to work through them pretty quickly. So I don't, I don't think that there'll be a lot of confusion, but if there is, we're certainly here to, to help with that as well. And that, that doesn't mean just because a business or an entity has a sort of good housekeeping, good housekeeping seal of approval that you don't need to take your own precautions. Absolutely. I mean, there's really no guarantee point. you won't run into somebody with the virus anywhere you go. So everybody has to take it on themselves to be responsible and careful for yourself and for others and your family as well. Uh, on That leads to enforcement because uh, this isn't just industry to industry. We've already had some enforcement uh, issues. We've already had inquiries people complaining about certain businesses and entities and Commissioner Johnson has written letters and talked to people and said, hey, you know, we got this complaint. You just can't do that or you can't do it that way. Uh, and we've been able to work with a lot of people to address their behavior. I, I don't expect that'll stop. And when it comes to people coming in from out of state and failing to quarantine, you know, this is not just a main phenomenon. It's kind of a national phenomenon. Most states are imposing some kind of quarantine on people coming from away coming from out of state including people coming back to the state of maine uh, snowbirds and the like and they're aware of it and they understand why it's important to their own health and safety to do this not just to the health and safety of everybody else they might come into contact with so we've uh, you know we've had calls we've had concerns and we take those concerns very seriously enforcement will not be um easy but we're there to help and there to help people understand why these rules are in effect, first and foremost. Great. Thanks, Amy. We will turn now to Kevin Miller over at the Press Herald. Go ahead, Kevin. Hi, thank you very much. I have a, a question for the governor and then one for Dr. Shaw uh, first. Uh, uh, governor or commissioner, um, there's been a lot of talk about maybe doing a county by county approach in the past or kind of looking at the regional differences, you know, certainly recognizing that COVID circumstances and population densities are much more different in Portland than say Greenville or Callis. Can you talk about, it doesn't look like you, you went in that direction. Uh, can you talk Correct. about why not and how, how much discussion there was about that? Sure. You know, Data can be useful, but data can be a little deceiving, too. Just because a county you live in or stay, you know, reside in or work in doesn't have a lot of numbers jumping off the charts doesn't mean the virus is not there. That's one thing. Uh, secondly, um, we are looking at county by county for some activities. Uh, let's talk about golf. <laughs> We've gotten a tremendous about, amount of emails and concerns about golf. I suggested at one point that we start with miniature golf, but that didn't <laughs> fly well. And uh, But so we're talking about golf courses and we are talking about, and I'm talking with other governors about golf courses. They're getting the same sort of lobbying effort. We want to be sure that because Massachusetts has not yet opened golf courses and Massachusetts is still a hot spot, much more so than Maine, New Hampshire, or Vermont, that we act in a similar way and that we don't implicitly invite people from a high incidence area to flock up here on a lovely day to play golf in Maine because their golf golf courses are closed. So we have talked about a county by county mm -hmm. golf protocol in fact. Yeah. If you would like to address that. Yeah, no, I think I think there are ways to look at restrictions county by county. I think there are also opportunities that we are kind of actively talking about as well to think about or there are options for some of our rural counties to open certain things a little bit more quickly. The governor talked um, in her opening about safety and safe pro safe protocols as, um, as the metric there. And so we are trying to apply that and look at that regionally to see, are there other things we could be doing in different counties um, that maybe aren't appropriate statewide at this point, but might be okay in certain counties. And so I think you'll see more on that. We've certainly left a lot of room, I think, in the staged approach to be able to look at those options and, and move move that way if we choose to. Great. And Thank Kevin, you said you had a... Yeah, go ahead, Kevin. Yep. You, uh, you've discussed in the past um, the importance of the R factor, the transmission rate from, from uh, person to person. Um, and making sure that that gets below zero or as close as or below one as close to zero as you can. 
Do you know what the R the R rate of R factor is in Maine right now, and how much did that play into your decision, and kind of what you're thinking about going forward for this phased reopening? So Kevin is asking about the number of the the rate of transmission of new cases in Maine, and and as Kevin notes. In epidemiology, they sometimes boil that down to a single number. And when it's above one, we know that the outbreak is expanding. And when it falls below, it, it, we hope it's contracting. Uh, so, Kevin, right now, because we've got, a, we've got such a small number of cases relative to, say, New York, um, we don't really calculate it on a day-to-day -day basis. But what we can intuit based on just the last three days uh, of transmission alone uh, is that just again for the last three days, the R value is approaching one. It hasn't gone below one yet, but it's around one. Uh, the reason I'm, I'm, I want to be careful on that is that that number can change hour by hour in an outbreak. And so we look at it in general terms every couple of weeks. We don't really have a, um, an LED on our wall that changes as the numbers change. We look at it every couple of weeks using a moving average. And based on just the last 72 or 96 hours, it's approaching one. Ideally, we'd like to see it dip below one and see that curve not just flatten, but actually start trending downward. That's really where we'd like to go. Uh, and that would give us even more security as we move through these stages. We're getting there, but we're not there yet. Uh, I'd like to turn next over to Phil Hirschkorn at WMTW. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shaw. You're live, Phil. Go for it. Sorry about that. I had to call up my notes here. I have a question for each of you, of course. Dr. Shaw, a Harvard study says, and this is slightly in a different direction from everyone else, a Harvard study says Maine is conducting 30% fewer tests than needed to safely reopen the state. Are you confident we can close the gap in May now that that's our target gradual reopening? And Governor Mills, Governor Mills, given the fact that we don't have a hospital surge, is the idea of setting up arenas in Portland and Bangor for extra beds on hold? If so, how else are you planning to spend the $11 million allocated by the legislature for coronavirus emergency needs. Last we checked, only $100,000 of those funds have been used. Great. Uh, so, Phil, let's start. Um, maybe we'll start with the back and then and work uh, and work our way toward the top. So, uh, one of the. Uh, uh, we'll start with testing because that the testing question links the first part and the last part of your question. And you're right, Phil, there have been different estimates of the total amount of testing that any state needs to provide or offer in order to start moving forward. This is different and, and should be looked at differently than the total number of tests that are being done. The metric that you're referring to is the overall total capacity of tests that could be done. And that's what we're working on. Our goal is to allow it such that any physician in the state of Maine can offer a, a, a test for COVID-19 to any of his or her patients without having to worry about resource availability. That's our goal. And as you correctly know, one of our goals is to double or triple the overall capacity in the state, which is consistent with being in at that 35% mark. Some, of, some other analysis that just came out yesterday actually suggests that in order for Maine to bridge that gap and start moving forward, the gap is actually much smaller on the order of about only 170 additional tests that Maine would need to be able to offer. As you can, as you can see, Phil, there's a wide variety, but our goal is to significantly expand it. And the way that we know that the way that we will know that we are there is when the overall number of positive tests that we are getting, the percentage of positive tests drops down to what we saw in South Korea. Right now we're at five to six percent positive and we'd like to be closer to the two percent range that gives us a sense of whether we're on the right track um you, you also and then i'll turn it sure. over to the governor on uh, i think you were asking about alternative care sites and the use of the 11 million dollars appropriated by the legislature and we've been pretty cautious about how we spend money given these tough economic times and i think and commissioner lambrew is here as well to uh, answer your question but i think the answer is we have not spent a lot of money on standing up the uh, alternative care sites we have had help from the national guard uh, and some federal help in that uh, and but we have not fully done that because it would cost a lot of money and until we know we need them we're ready to do it if we need to 
uh, but we have not spent a lot of money on the alternative care sites. Is that, she says that's right, okay. Great. <laughs> okay, thanks, Phil. We will turn now to Michael Fern over at the main edge. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Please go ahead, Michael. You're on mute, Michael. We could just make up a question. And answer. Did you mean to ask me? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Michael, should we? Whether what? I had my hair done last month? No, I didn't. <laughs> I need to get mine done. I, I put that Floby on eBay way too soon. We will. Um, Michael, we'll come back to you in just a second. Uh, we'll I'm turn now to Steve. Oh, okay, great. Uh, I have two questions, one for Commissioner uh, Johnson and one for Governor Mills. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, uh, we've had a few businesses in the Bangor area announce their permanent closure the last few weeks. Uh, does, do you have any data or a sense of how many businesses have ended up closing altogether across wow. the state or may end up closing? And Governor Mills, to follow up the question about the festivals, how will stage three impact outdoor July 4 and main bicentennial parades and fireworks celebrations. Well, the, bi the bicentennial parade has already been put off, <laughs> at least to the fall, I believe. And a lot of the bicentennial activities we were looking forward to have been just put off for now. July 4th, we're going to deal with that in May and June. <laughs> it's, really, it's really tough to say, oh, we're going to all have 4th of July parades right now because there's, there's that inevitable gathering, that inevitable congregation of people that, and it brings a lot of people from other, from other states and other areas. We just got to be real cautious about how we plan those kinds of usual enjoyable activities. Yeah, and so back to your other question about business closures, you know, certainly um, it's a concern of ours. Uh, we are hearing and talking to some businesses as well and, and hearing some of the same things that you're hearing. I think the goal is to stand up as many resources to support businesses as we can and to find as quickly as possible safe practices for businesses to start operating again, even if it's in a modified fashion, um, to help to help support that. So um, it's absolutely a concern. It's something we, we want to work closely with the business community on. Great. Thank you. Yep. Thanks a lot, Michael. Up next is Steve Missler at Maine Public. Thanks for taking the call. Uh, two quick questions. Um, first for Dr. Shaw, I, I know you sort of addressed this testing issue. I know that's a big metric that you guys are considering. I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to boil down, do you feel like you have enough capacity to do what you need to do to support this phase to reopening now? And I ask that because it sounds like the states are not going to get much help from the White House on this. There was a document saying that the White House, that the, the feds will be the supplier of last resort. So if that's the case, um, where does Maine go if it does suddenly need or feels the need that it to expand testing capacity? And then the second question is for uh, Governor Mills, just about, and maybe or maybe uh, Commissioner Johnson. I'm not sure. It sounds like the stage two opening would allow for restaurants potentially to reopen, but then stage three. Um, would allow bars. So there's there's two stages for those two different things, yet there are a lot of restaurants with bars and vice versa. So I'm just, if you could just clarify that, that'd be great. So I'll, uh, Steve, I'll, I'll tackle the testing question. Uh, you're right, we do need to expand our capacity and that's something that we're working on. Uh, we are working with an organization uh, to, to bring on additional testing capacity at our laboratory in Maine that I think will go a significant step toward bridging that gap. The other thing that we're going to start working on more is working with hospitals across the state that themselves would like to offer testing within their facility and providing them with technical assistance on how to go about doing that, as well as giving them some tips on how to go through the CLIA process. Those are our two primary planks right now to expand testing for the nucleic acid, the PCR test. And then we're also simultaneously looking at the role, the utility of antibody testing. Uh, I hope to have a lot more information on the former, that partnership that we're exploring. I'm hoping to have a lot more information for that, on that for you in the coming days, and especially the numbers around that. And on the difference between restaurants and bars, well, I'm no expert. But your question sort of evokes the picture of the Edward Hopper painting. I can't remember what it's called, but it's one guy sitting at the end of a bar. There's a neon sign. You know what? You know the one I mean, right? 
That's a bar, but that's not like any bar in Maine. <laughs> and bars generally encourage people to get close to each other and congregate in a different way than restaurants do. Yes, restaurants, many of them have bars. And we're talking about bars that don't have restaurants in stage three. And I know a couple, not well, but I know of them. <laughs> and um, uh, it's perfectly appropriate to go to a restaurant, sit down, order a light meal and have a drink at stage two. Um, but um, restaurants usually have seating areas and we're part of the protocols we're using, Heather Johnson, Commissioner Johnson can explain that, will be to keep people apart. And I'm encouraging towns and cities to look at their uh, the traffic patterns, maybe open up some of the streets in busy areas of town so you have a walking promenade where people can dine outside and keep their distance outside a restaurant. You know, we talk about reimagining and reinventing the way we do things. I'm hoping and inviting people to do just that. Yeah, no, I think we are working carefully with the industries on on these safety protocols and working directly with Commissioner Lambrew's team, healthcare experts that she's um, put into a team to work with us on business process. And and right now it appears there is a, a difference there around what restaurants are able to do from a capacity perspective and from a distancing perspective. But we'll continue to work through the, that level of detail and, and work uh, get that to be more public here shortly. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. We will go now to Jessica Piper over at the BDN. Um, hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Um, Governor Mills, first a, a question for you. Um, I know in recent days your administration has allowed stores, Hobby Lobby being one example, to open up. Are you going to continue accepting applications for exemptions? Um, like that, and how do you keep them from weakening the, the stay-at-home order? Yeah, the question is about, for instance, Hobby Lobby uh, and other entities that have gotten letters of approval, conditional approval from state government to open up in some capacity or to do business in some way. That, that has been happening. That will continue to be happening. I think the reason that that particular entity yeah. got a letter was because like other craft stores and other craft stores are now open for business to some extent, that they provide the cloth for the cloth coverings mm -hmm. and Commissioner Johnson may be able to explain. Yeah, no, I think that's a perfect explanation, Governor. Originally, um, craft stores and fabric stores were closed. Um, and then when the CDC released guidance around these cloth face coverings, we um, made the adjustment to allow people to go purchase materials that would help make them safer. So, Okay. And the last question for today goes to Dustin Vlitkowski from the New England Cable News. Go ahead, Dustin. Hi, Dr. Shine, Governor Mills. Uh, Governor, what's your initial read on how we would tighten things down again if need be? Is that a week-by-week -week determination, day-to-day, -day, as time goes on? And does your administration make the determination, or does the legislature eventually take over? On these restrictions, as so long as there is an, a state, so long as there is a state of civil emergency declared, and there is. Uh, the decisions on these matters will be up to the administration, the executive branch of government. That's what the uh, statute, uh, the laws allow and require. Uh, and week to week, again, it will be a data-driven uh, decision, decision-making process, not simply, do I think things are going well, do I not think things are going it, And it's not to prefer one kind of business over another for non-data-driven reasons, but simply to allow people to live again in public to some extent, but safely and with all due consideration to everyone's health and safety. Those are uh, the criteria, the epidemiological criteria that Dr. Shaw uh, described in detail and the criteria that we discussed last week in terms of what activities draw more people. You know, there's a difference between saying, looking at basketball games, which is pretty interpersonal contact you know, driven versus tennis, for instance, or croquet or individual sports. There's a difference in each of these activities and that difference relates to public health and public and personal contact. That's what we're looking at. That was our last question, Governor. Oh, it was. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you, Commissioner Johnson, Dr. Shaw, Commissioner Lambrew. Uh, I want to make sure that 
We emphasize this is an individual decision, business by business, sector by sector. Like just because certain kinds of businesses are allowed to do business within the protocols, if one particular business violates that protocol, they may lose their license. They may lose their ability to do, to do business at all, or they may receive a warning that says, hey, we heard a complaint. Why, why is this happening? Can you correct the situation? We want people to live semi-normal lives, but we want them to all respect the health and safety of all Maine people. We're living in a different normal now where, you know, forehead thermometers are going to be pretty common when you go out to eat or go out to a business and you might have your temperature taken. Don't take offense. Where face coverings, whether stylish or simple, will be commonplace. And it makes a difference. You know, we all want to attend friends' funerals and hug our families and friends who've lost people. We all want to go to weddings and other events and cocktail parties and shake hands again. But we're not going to do that. We're going to be able to commune with other people, but not in the same way, not in the same sense we have in the past. We want to smile when we greet a friend or laugh at their jokes or scowl at their misbehaving children, but with a face covering, it's not going to be visible. It's going to be different. We still have to assume that this virus is among us, and that it is everywhere. But I'm pleased to be able to work with such great people and with the private sector as well, so many members of the private sector, in announcing this staged or phased reopening of Maine's economy and Maine's way of life. Thank you.